Kenilworth's history begins during the Norman Conquest and spans over 900 years. It won't surprise you that I shall focus mostly on the Tudor comings and goings at the castle. Of course, the castle is now synonymous with the lives of Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester, and how he laid his love on the line for his beau, Queen Elizabeth I. Kenilworth was one of three ancient castles, which in 1524 King Henry VIII wished to see uphold and repaired and maintained. He was attracted by Kenilworth's fine buildings and nearby hunting in the Wellstock Park. Between 1524 and 1526, Henry spent the considerable sum of £460 on renovation and the erection of several wooden frame buildings, all long gone but diarised to have featured stained glass bearing the arms of the king. Our visit on a brisk and windy winter's day would provide more than a challenge for the audio equipment. As much as I've tried to minimise the background sound, it's impossible to filter it all out without detrimentally affecting all of our voices. Talking of voices, please remember I have absolutely no control over whom I record. Whilst we may be in an ancient castle, those I capture rarely communicate in an old form of English, nor do they use Latin. Only when I discover exactly where they are, and the mechanics of how they communicate, will I be able to give you an answer as to why they speak in modern English. Until then, find some earphones if you can, and enjoy with a glass of something nice. You want to listen to the end of this video, there are some remarkably VP that were first, even for me. As you enter modern day Kenilworth, you walk over what was the tilt yard, an area of the castle set aside for jousting. Tournaments were a favourite pastime of royalty, especially in the Tudor period. This illustration dates back to the early 1500s and is an excerpt from the Westminster Tournament Roll. The Black Knight charges his opponent, breaking his lance, while the royal and noble bystanders watch on from a decorative viewing platform. This demonstration of pageantry would have been common to many English castles of the period. The remaining structures of the castle are still prominent on the panorama of this mid-17th century engraving. The tilt yard stands on the far right, bridging the town with a gatehouse. Built by King John from 1210 to 1215, Mortimer's Tower was the principal entrance and is named after Roger Mortimer, who hosted a notable jousting tournament here in 1279. The narrow entry meant that it was easily defended by a relatively small number of men. Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, an infamous beau of Elizabeth I, took possession of Kenilworth in 1563. For a brief period, the castle had been owned by his father, John Dudley, who erected the stables. The stabling was sufficient for 30 great horses and 20 geldings, with room above for silage and accommodation for grooms. Lund's Tower is the best preserved of King John's wall towers and dates 1210 to 1215. It had three levels and the second being a residential chamber. John Ashford was the constable of the castle and responsible for its security. He was a full-time resident and lived in the two-storey timber building around 1400 with all of his family. It's no coincidence that the EVP captured in Lund's Tower reflects who would have lived here. From their language, I wonder if they see me as an imposter and someone they need to dispatch. Tracy and I, meanwhile, are looking through the defensive arrow slits in the wall. So we know, I suppose, we're in black. Yeah. Not obvious, though, is it? The sword. The sword. The sword. Are we being warned that our lives are in danger? Or is this gentleman warning someone in his own timeline that they're in peril? Built by 
by Robert Dudley in the early 1570s, it was converted after the Civil War of the 1640s to a private residence by Colonel Joseph Hawksworth, who was an MP and Governor of nearby Warwick Castle. Entering the gatehouse, we immediately pick up on the welcoming atmosphere. It's nice to know that those around me wanted to help. This room was originally part of the gate passage, but after alteration was used as a hall and dining room. The mural was painted relatively recently in 1946 by illustrator Roy Coombs and is based on a fresco depicting the house in about 1620. It wouldn't feel like a proper Tudor visit without mention of Henry and I'm delighted to say that yet again I've captured his name. Of course whether it's really him though I can't say. Hey look, Henry's built his state apartments in 1520. Oh, this is the only room in the castle with pieces remaining that Robert Dudley would be familiar with. The fireplace, which was used by Queen Elizabeth I, is dated 1571 and features Dudley's initials. The overmantel carving dates to the same period but was moved here from another room of the castle. As we stand looking at the fireplace, we discuss how it might have been to sit in front and warm ourselves on a cold winter's day. I wonder who the lady is that speaks, and what she'd like me to do for her. It was really cozy, if you imagine that fire being flooring away. The next lady's voice is incredibly clear. Listen to how the tone and clarity is better than ours. The recorder was placed on a table away from where we stood, and it sounds like she's standing closer to the machine than us. It's always atmosphere in here, though, isn't it? Yeah, it does. But it's not. No. But Elizabeth was always tricky. Yeah, she's always tricky. Yeah. I was standing with my hand placed on Dudley's initials on the fireplace. Behind me, I could feel that familiar fizzing of energy. Sorry, I'm behind you. Built as part of the extension to the gatehouse in the 1650s, this room may always have been a bedroom, but good Queen Bess was never to lay her head on this pillow. As we admire the bedroom and the gorgeous four-poster, a whispering voice is captured on the recorder. Sadly, nobody did make a surprise appearance. Well, not yet anyway. But make sure you keep an eye out in the bedroom if you visit. Robert Dudley created this garden over 400 years ago for Elizabeth I's visit in 1575. It was the first great court garden of the Elizabethan age and was to begin a trend in gardening that set the standard for English stately homes and castles. The wind had picked up and in the open garden I thought I'd invite those who might be able to hear my voice to join me as I walk the paths. I was absolutely delighted to hear the reply. I wonder who the gentleman was. Who's going to come and walk with me in the garden? It's a bit blustery today, but it's still nice. <laughs> 
Tracy and I were alone in the garden for the whole time we recorded. The child's voice I capture as we stand by the birdhouse is clearer than mine. It seems even children that have passed still have to question everything. There's bird cages and there's bird cages, but that's the... That's the... That's the... Still standing by the birdhouse, I was sure that I'd heard someone crunching on the gravel as they approached us from behind. Only there's no gravel to crunch. That's weird. I thought there was someone walking. Did you not hear it? I heard distinctly, but not... No, that was gravel. I heard gravel, and it was that way. Well, it may well have been gravel. Someone's behind us. As we walked towards the Swan Tower, Tracy physically turned around as she heard a male voice that made her jump. I just heard something else. We've no way of knowing if what the speaker says is true or who it might be that's buried. The tower stands at the northwest corner of the outer wall and dates to the 13th century defences, but was later used as a small banqueting house. The voice captured at the Swan Tower sounds like a child's voice. Which Richard might he be scorning? King Richard I, who showed little interest in the castle or wasn't much liked, or Richard de Twinties, a stonemason who was working on the construction of the chapel, whose tools were unfairly seized by the constable bringing his family to the brink of starvation. Sadly, we'll never know. Originated as part of the 13th century defences, altered perhaps in the 14th century. The original 12th century entrance to the keep was replaced in the 16th century with a small courtyard which overlooks the fashionable Elizabethan garden beyond. The Norman keep or great tower is without a doubt the most commanding building of the castle. Much of the structure was built by Geoffrey de Clinton around 1124 to 1130 but it was Robert Dudley who modernised the building enlarging the windows in the 16th century. After the Civil War of the 1640s, the keep was deliberately destroyed to stop it falling into the hands of the enemy. This is one of those difficult EVP that makes me scratch my head. I'm pretty sure the speakers are aware that I can't always hear them mentally and that I'll need to review the recordings later. I would gladly help them when I can, but other than say a prayer for their peace, what more can I do? The main kitchen, built by John of Gaunt in the 1370s, was still in use well into the 17th century and was one of the largest in medieval England. This is, without a doubt, one of the most interesting EVP I have ever captured. Not only are there four voices, but the speaker's conversation also mentions the name of a historical person, reference to the location of the recording and possibly that they acknowledge my presence. I couldn't hope for more. The 
These cellars sit at the base of the strong tower and were used for the storage of provisions. They were built by John of Gaunt in the 1370s and feature remarkable vaulted ceilings as do all of the floors of the tower. Even though the area was historically a food storage area, it had a very different feeling to me. It was almost church-like, as if I needed to be reverential. I had no idea of what I would capture at the time. The gentlemen are simply remarkable. The first voice is of an older gentleman, who stresses his words very carefully, so that his message can be heard clearly. This makes perfect sense. The cellars being colder than the rooms above ground would have been suitable for resting a body prior to a later burial. The second gentleman sounds much younger, and the character of his voice is very different. His words are spoken more quickly with a youthful tone. There's a sad resonance to his message as he tells us where he's buried. <laughs> I, and now you, know these two men existed and where they lie. If you visit, please think of them. John of Gaunt's Great Hall, which dates from 1373, would have been where members of his household date on a day-to-day -day basis in common with other great halls in palaces such as Hampton Court. Only on important feast days and events would the head of the castle dine lavishly in the hall. I was being rather cheeky as we entered the remains of the great hall, saying it didn't look quite so great anymore, and the gentleman who hears my remarks makes it pretty clear what he thinks of me. It's not looking so great at the moment. <laughs> The outlook from the tower afforded senior household officials a fine view from their lodgings over the deer park in the mere below. Another EVP conundrum from this tower. Who is the gentleman with such a fabulous name? And was he really the one that brought me to the castle, or is he referring to a past visitor? <coughs> John of Gaunt lightly built the great chambers in the late 1300s to provide comfortable accommodation for important guests and the state apartments for himself. The walls may be gone and the wind may whistle through, but the atmosphere remains of somewhere joyful and happy. I have to be honest, this gentleman's remark makes me blush. I never forget how incredibly lucky I am to do what I do and to be able to communicate with all of our friends unseen. I think they're lovely too. Maybe that's why it works so well between us. Where to? Elizabeth was 42 when she last visited Kenilworth in 1575. And during her stay, Dudley made his final play for the Queen, but when she left, he was in little doubt of having lost her affections. This picture of Elizabeth is circa 1585 at one of her palaces. Her private apartments included a meeting room where VIPs were invited to pay their respects. Next door was the inner sanctum, the Queen's bedchamber. The Queen's bedchamber was the most private room in Leicester's building and had two fireplaces separated by a timber wall, against which Elizabeth's bed was believed to sit. Only the Queen and her ladies-in-waiting would have had access to this stately room. 
In this painting, dating to 1580, Dudley is shown dancing an energetic lavolta with his queen. The room was formerly a long room with numerous bay windows where Elizabeth could relax in private. Climbing up to the top of the building was something I didn't enjoy. I'm not great with heights and there are gaps in between the planks that mean you can see down below. It was very windy and exposed and all I could hear at the time was wind with the odd birds walking on the wing. What I captured up high, even for me, is very rare. I only have a few musical EVP and over 15,000 clips and none so clear as this. It doesn't sound like medieval song to me, but I'm no expert. Please do let me know if you recognise the tune. Different now. Silly old bullets here. Oh, could have been floorboard. Different now. Silly old bullets here. Oh, could have been floorboard. Now. Behind you are the stables. In front on the higher ground is the inner court. In the 16th century there would have been a magnificent front that joined Leicester's building to the keep. The two-storey building you see in my recreation is based upon drawings of Henry VIII's editions, which were completed in around 1530. Only scant footings of the buildings remain, but it was enough to bring it back to life, in my mind. As I stand looking up at Kenilworth Castle, wondering who I might hear when I get home, I pick up a gentleman's message that lets me know I haven't been told everything on this visit. Maybe I need to return. Sadly, it's now time to leave. Thank you for watching, and thank you for sharing my passion in hearing the voices of those who still live, but who may be forgotten to many, but never to us. Until next time, goodbye.